Starting slowly. Yes, we are on. So I hope everyone can see and hear me. Um, this is the first time we do it this way. So this is a extremely kind of triple hybrid uh, uh, seminar. So welcome to the Warsaw University uh, Tuesday seminar series. Um, uh, this is the usual Zoom link uh, for people joining the seminar. And, uh, well, a significant part of the Warsaw University staff is actually now enjoying themselves at a workshop uh, here in Crete. And um, so, so this is kind of a combined seminar and a workshop uh, we are organizing here. And the, the speaker today is Brian Holler from uh, Space uh, Telescope Science Institute, uh, whose topic is, like, is actually very relevant to our workshop here as well. And uh, Brian um, is a researcher at the uh, STSI in Baltimore, Maryland. And he's a member of the uh, MIRI instrument team on JWST. He's very excited, I believe, uh, to, to, uh, to the, looking forward to the launch of the, uh, of the, space, the spacecraft. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, Brian did his PG in 2016 in Colorado. And he is also, uh, he has, uh, has been thinking also ahead of JWST about um, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. And he kindly agreed to give us uh, a, an overview of the, the telescope, especially in the context of exploring our solar system. So Brian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here, uh, even though this is my own living room, uh, it sounds much better to be in Crete, but uh, thank you for letting me uh, join. Um, so I'll be talking about <clears throat> NASA's next, next space telescope, uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, with a uh, focus on <clears throat> what it can do for solar system observations. So, come on. So there's now a, an ever-growing hist rich history of space telescope assets, um, starting with Hubble uh, back in 1990, uh, which is still operating today. Um, and <clears throat> since then, we've added additional telescopes, uh, such as Chandra for X-ray observations uh, in the late 90s, uh, Spitzer, uh, <clears throat> which covered... Um, some of the, the mid infrared uh, and was just decommissioned last year. Uh, it lasted for about 17 years uh, until the coolant and fuel ran out. <clears throat> and then of course, uh, next month, uh, it's crazy to say that at this point, we've never been this close, uh, but next month on December 18th, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will launch, uh, hopefully beginning a 10 year uh, mission um, of exploration and discovery. Uh, so the, the next space telescope, uh, after James Webb, uh, is known as Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, uh, is currently set for launch in late 2026, uh, with a, uh, an absolute latest launch date at this point of, uh, May, 2027. Uh, this was, this was just announced in September, um, the, the timing on that. So this is what I'll be focusing on uh, to get you uh, excited for uh, what comes after James Webb, because um, there certainly is a lot of excitement now uh, waiting for launch from Karoo. So I just want to point out some of the highlights of uh, the Roman Space Telescope. Um, it'll be orbiting at L2, uh, similar to James Webb, um, and passively cooled to 260 Kelvin. Uh, so there's no active cooling at all um, on this telescope, unlike James Webb, which has a cryo cooler for MIRI. Um, this will be operating purely at uh, ambient temperature with, uh, with that uh, small sun shield there. Um, it contains, or it's a, it's a 2.4 meter aperture, probably should mention that first, uh, which is the same 
aperture size or primary mirror size as Hubble. Uh, so it's a Hubble sized spacecraft. Um, and there are two instruments on board, the wide field instrument, which is the going to be the primary workhorse instrument um, is a, a large, an imager with a large field of view uh, and also some uh, spectroscopic capabilities, uh, as well as a technology demonstration, uh, the chronographic instrument uh, for um, exoplanet observations. Uh, for the purposes of, uh, of solar system observations, uh, there's currently there are currently no plans to support moving target tracking, uh, so it won't be able to do targeted observations of known um, solar system objects. But as I'll show later on, uh, this is not a problem uh, for Roman. Uh, Roman is a survey machine um, and will excel at uh, at uh, serendipitous observations of solar system objects. Uh, it will have a, a, a field of regard, uh, different or distinct from that of James Webb. Uh, so the field of regard is the allowed range of solar elongation angles um, that it can observe at in order to maintain uh, you know, thermal stability. Uh, so it can actually look a little closer into the sun than James Webb uh, and a little farther away from opposition. Um, Webb can do uh, 85 degrees to 135 uh, and Roman does 54 to 126. So this actually results in a larger uh, continuous viewing zone, uh, as you see there on the right in the side view. Um, so there is a larger region of the sky that can be observed at any point in the year. Uh, for Webb, it's about five degrees. For uh, Roman, it is 36 degrees around both ecliptic poles. <laughs> um, things that have been added along the way. Um, this mission has been in design for a few years now. Uh, it was one of the uh, recommendations from the previous decadal survey. Um, and uh, since then, we've added a longer wavelength filter covering uh, about 2 to 2.3 microns, uh, which would be good for um, solar system observations, specifically looking for water ice absorption. Uh, and there are also uh, new prism and grism slitless spectroscopy modes for the WFI. Um, these are less so important for solar system, but possibly, you know, obviously important for um, other science, uh, other science investigations, such as, you know, galaxies, getting spectroscopy of galaxies uh, in a large field of view, for instance. So those will also be included in the filter wheel. Uh, for those of you who have been following the mission at all, uh, previous to this talk, uh, only last year, so in May of last year, uh, the telescope was renamed to the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Prior to that, it was known as WFIRST, uh, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. Um, so similar to how uh, uh, Spitzer was renamed um, prior to launch, uh, this telescope was also uh, recently renamed. And it celebrates uh, the mother of Hubble, uh, Nancy Grace Roman, uh, who passed away in 2018. Um, she was the first chief of astronomy at NASA, uh, the first woman to hold an executive position at NASA. Um, and she really was instrumental, uh, really pushed for the Hubble Space Telescope to be um, funded and built and launched. Uh, as you see in the, the quote down there, um, you know, organizing the astronomers and convincing Congress to, uh, to get um, Hubble off the ground. Uh, and I think we can all be thankful for that effort. Uh, and for, you know, for these reasons, uh, we don't use, or the, the Roman team uh, encourages people not to use acronyms. So it's not NGRST, it's Roman, right? If you're referring to the telescope, it's always Roman. Um, and uh, the acronyms are never really used uh, in order to, to honor uh, her legacy. So, 
and some current mission status. Uh, nearing the end of phase C right now, uh, which uh, translating that into um, something useful, uh, that's when the hardware is being built, right? It's when uh, everything is being constructed. Uh, and currently in this transition period between phase C and phase D, and phase D is testing. Um, it passed all of its critical design reviews this year uh, for both of the instruments, uh, the ground system, uh, which is at, uh, you know, um, at Space Telescope in Baltimore, as well as IPAC in California. Uh, and then the whole, the whole mission critical design review was passed as well. And that's what moved it from phase C into phase D. Uh, so this is moving along um, quite nicely. Uh, as I mentioned before, launch is planned for late 2026. Uh, with that window extending into May 2027. Uh, it'll have a nominal five-year mission uh, with the possibility of extending uh, for an additional five years. So uh, I'll go into a little bit on the actual instruments themselves. I'll be focusing on the wide field instrument, uh, less so on the chronograph, but I will present some information on the chronograph. So the WFI is uh, a um, an imager made up of 18 separate uh, H4RG10 detectors. Um, all of the 18, all 18 of the flight detectors are in hand. Uh, they are ready to go, uh, and there are plenty of spares available. I believe there's something like you know 10 or so additional spares uh, that could be used as well. Uh, it has a total of 300 megapixels. Uh, a spatial sampling of uh, 110 milliarc seconds per pixel. Uh, and this is comparable to that of Miri on James Webb. So let's see if I line these up correctly. Nice. All right. So the field of view uh, is roughly um, 0.8 by 0.4 uh, degrees uh, for a total area of about a quarter of a square degree. Uh, and as you can see in this image here, there are gaps between the detectors. So you remove that, that area um, and it's not a perfect square. You know, it's this upside down smile shape. Um, a frown, it's a frown shape. Um, <laughs> so it covers a, a whole quarter square degree of sky. Um, and this is about a hundred times the size of a Hubble field of view. Uh, which is very impressive. All in one pointing, you get 100 uh, Hubble fields of view, as you see here. Uh, there are the pillars of creation in the center um, in this box, uh, and Roman will cover the entire area surrounding it. It's also going to be a lot of data, obviously, coming down from this telescope, you know, with a 300 megapixel uh, imager, uh, 18 detectors, right? Here's a comparison of all of the data obtained with Hubble over the past 30 years. It's 172 terabytes, which doesn't sound like a whole lot anymore. Um, compared to what we expect for Webb, about 10 times more uh, there. But then Roman, uh, we're going into the petabyte territory, 20 petabytes just in the uh, five-year nominal primary mission, right? So you can imagine that that doubles uh, for the, ex if you add in the extended mission. Um, be sending quite a bit of data down to Earth each day. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that all Roman data, uh, whether or not it's part of a core community survey, which I'll get into, or whether it's a, um, a general observer program, all of it will be non-proprietary. There'll be no proprietary period for any of these data. Um, and to be accessible in MAST um, immediately once it is downlinked and processed on the ground, it'd be immediately available uh, to everyone on the planet. So, yeah, and I'll get more into some of those details a bit soon. So what, uh, what filters are provided with the WFI? Uh, you have everything from uh, the very edge of the visible um, in the, the red-orange region uh, out to um, 2.3 microns. 
uh, and these are all wide band filters. There are no narrow band filters. Um, everything is wide. Uh, and there's also a, a very wide band filter uh, shown in the gray hatched um, uh, throughput curve here. Uh, that is the F146, and that covers uh, about <clears throat> 0.8 to 2 microns. Um, so a very wide band filter for deep searches, uh, very useful for that. Uh, and then we also have here the throughputs for the GRISM and PRISM modes, uh, showing the uh, wavelength ranges of those, which cover a, a wide range as well. The Roman <laughs> exposure time calculator is currently available. Uh, it is the, uh, you have to use the Pandaya engine, uh, which is a Python based, um, Python based engine. Uh, it was developed at STSCI. It is the same tool used for James Webb. Uh, it is what is underlying the, uh, the um, JWST ETC web, app, web application. Um, and the, that same tool is, is now available for Roman. There is no web app right now, uh, but there may be one in the coming years. Uh, we haven't been asked to do that yet. Um, all the filter transmission profiles uh, are available except for the new F213 filter that is not yet added into the, the ETC for Roman. Uh, and there are approximate detector properties uh, in there. Uh, you can use this for PRISM and GRISM that is uh, currently available. Um, they're still working on the timing for the detectors. Uh, you know, the, just like James Webb, it, they behave a little differently from, you know, a regular, a regular camera or, you know, most ground-based instruments. Um, and they're still working out the timing on those. So right now it uses uh, the timing model for the near cam instrument on JW, JWST. Uh, and you can find more details uh, at that link um, to, in order to download the, the, the engine and the, uh, the relevant data files for it, if you want to play around and see the, uh, <clears throat> the capabilities of, of Roman uh, as we currently know it. There's some other tools available too. I believe that the uh, astronomer's proposal tool, APT, is currently being worked for Roman, uh, and that's used for determining, you know, overheads, uh, you know, lovely overheads, things like that. Um, not currently available, in progress, uh, so we don't know yet the, uh, you know, the overhead uh, model uh, for putting that out. There's also a uh, a prototype tool, the Mass WFI Field of View Overlay tool. You see some images on the right. Uh, it'll place the uh, the WFI um, uh, fields of view for each of those detect each of the eighteen detectors over a scene of your choice. Uh, you see there on the left and on the right uh, are um, uh, catalog identif uh, you know sorry objects from I believe the two mass catalog plotted in the fields of view to show um, where those targets are. Um, obviously you can choose something else other than the Andromeda galaxy to overlay this field of view on uh, to see if your targets fall in there or fall on a, on a chip gap, for instance, that'd be an important piece of this. Uh, but it's worth knowing this is currently a prototype um, and will be improved as, uh, as time goes on. All right, and a quick bit about the chronograph instrument. Um, it is the second instrument on Roman, uh, and it can be used for direct imaging and spectroscopy. Uh, covers a smaller wavelength range from about 0.55 to uh, 8.6 microns. So um, very, very near infrared and visible. Uh, and it can be used for, uh, so the, the, the best start of planet flux ratio today is a, a, you know, one to a million. Right, uh, so that's 10,000 times less than we need for detecting Earth analogs. Um, the Roman CGI will not quite get there, uh, not quite to the 10,000 times higher, but should be in the 100 to 1,000 times um, 
you know, better uh, flux ratio. Uh, so we can detect planets 1 billion times fainter than their host stars. Um, the idea here is it's a technology demonstration uh, and it'll pave the way for future missions um, that can then detect uh, Earth analogs around other stars. Uh, now I can focus on the core community surveys. So this is, these are going to take up 75% of the primary five-year mission. Um, and these will be used for uh, you know, meeting the three primary mission objectives of Roman. So that's measuring dark energy, investigating exoplanets, uh, as well as um, general astrophysics and planetary science. So each of these core community surveys, which I'll show in the coming slides, will be applicable to two of those three objectives. Uh, each one will be applicable to two of the three. Uh, and it's worth noting that the final details of the surveys uh, will be defined in a community-driven process. So what, you, what I'm going to show are uh, current, um, current details uh, or, or frameworks rather for, uh, for these surveys. Uh, they have yet to be fully defined, you know, positions on the sky, timing, filters, all that stuff, still open for, um, for, for definition. Uh, and there'll be opportunities to, to take part in that over the coming years. Uh, so the, the first of these core community surveys is the high latitude wide area survey. Uh, when I say high latitude, I mean high galactic latitude, um, not high ecliptic latitude, uh, high galactic latitude uh, to get away from the plane of the galaxy. I believe that uh, ultimately this will also try to avoid the ecliptic uh, for obvious reasons. Um, if you're trying to observe, um, you know, the, the purpose of this is to measure the shapes and redshifts of galaxies. Uh, to measure matter clustering over time. Uh, and you don't want um, interlopers, uh, such as asteroids, getting in the way. Uh, so be high latitude in both those senses. Um, and the idea is to cover 2,000 square degrees over the first two years of the mission. There's also a high latitude time domain survey that goes along with that. Uh, this is over a smaller area of the sky, so about, you know, somewhere between 5 and 20 square degrees. And this would be in the continuous viewing zone, so that you know, within 36 degrees of uh, one of the ecliptic poles. Um, and this, this would uh, occur over six months in the first two years of the mission, uh, with five-day cadence coming back to the same fields of view every five days. Uh, and the purpose of this is to do imaging and spectroscopy of uh, in order to identify type 1a supernovae uh, for studying the uh, expansion of the universe. And the third core community survey uh, is uh, the Galactic Bulge Time Domain Survey. Uh, so as you see here in this picture, it would occur close to the, uh, the galactic center, uh, within a few degrees of the galactic center. Um, and also this happens to correspond to a region where uh, the ecliptic crosses the galactic plane. Um, so it can be useful for uh, solar system observations as well. Um, but the purpose of the survey is uh, for imaging uh, with the, that uh, very wide band filter, the F146 filter. Um, and it's aimed at the detection of extrasolar planets through gravitational microlensing, right? If you have uh, there are going to be a lot of stars uh, in each of those fields of view, uh, and you can um, you can watch them for um, for signs of, of planets passing in front of those stars, uh, and you know by the same you know in the same way you can watch for asteroids passing in front of the stars as well um, uh, to get you know occultations essentially, uh, but that's not the purpose of this survey necessarily. Uh, it's just a, a bonus uh, on my, you know, from my point of view. Um, it's a larger, there's a cover two square degrees of sky. So that's uh, roughly eight, uh, eight fields of view, right? Yep, eight fields of view. Um, 
and it'd be it'd be over 13 months uh, with a 15 minute cadence uh, over six 72 day seasons. So if I'm reading that correctly, and as I said, these are not set in stone yet. If I'm reading that correctly, that means that uh, Roman will be focused on the galactic bulge for a full 72 day period, um, taking images every 15 minutes uh, with the wide filter. Uh, and then it'll go off and do something else for a while, come back um, and, and do it again. Uh, do that six times uh, when the uh, galactic bulge is within the field of regard. Uh, and here's uh, something I mentioned before. So the um, just visualizing it, uh, the general aster, the sorry, the core community surveys shown there in orange in that that left pie chart would cover about seventy to seventy five percent of the initial or uh, the nominal five year mission. Um, the there's an additional five percent for the coronography technology demonstration uh, survey, which is not considered a core community survey, um, but would be used for testing out the the CGI. Um, and then we have uh, what are known as general astrophysics surveys. Uh, these are equivalent to general observer programs with Hubble and James Webb, um, and those would take up. Uh, about 25% of the nominal mission. And at this point in time, what, uh, what the mission, what the Roman mission is saying is that the five-year extended mission uh, would be 100% general astrophysics surveys. So there's the ones that are competed. Uh, you submit proposals for, um, and I believe if you are a, uh, at a US institution, then you can receive funding um, otherwise, you cannot receive funding. Uh, and the, the, the unfortunate part in that sense uh, is if you can't receive funding, you're also not going to get proprietary data, right, with this mission. All the data, even if you've competed, written the proposal, won the proposal, uh, it'll still be non-proprietary. Um, I guess the, the good thing in that sense is that uh, you... Uh, yeah, you, know, you know what the program is uh, and can best make use of the data uh, immediately when they come down um, and are available. So uh, here's some opportunities to get involved with Roman. Uh, there will be a NASA Roses call next year um, for three different things. Uh, one is key project teams. So those are the teams that will be uh, making sure that um, the proper investigations are being done, you know, the fo focused investigations using the core community surveys. Um, it was also the Coronagraph Community Participation Program, uh, which is for uh, making use of the CGI observations uh, that I mentioned. So that's 5% of the, the nominal mission. It's three months of, of time in the first year and a half. Uh, so that would help plan those observations for that larger survey. Um, and then there's the wide field instrument preparatory science uh, uh, call. Uh, we work on simulations, developing software uh, to get ready for all of the data coming down from, from the core community surveys. Uh, as I mentioned, these would most likely come with funding for US collaborators. Um, but it is still a way to get involved uh, with the definition of, uh, of some of the surveys uh, planned with Roman. Um, so, yeah, I know that this is probably not the best audience, obviously, for discussing funding opportunities, but you can still be involved with the, the science definition. Uh, there's also an upcoming conference in February of next year. Um, it is going to be a hybrid conference, uh, virtual and online. Uh, registration is free and uh, talks and poster abstracts are currently being accepted uh, with the abstracts due on November 29th. Um, this is uh, exploring the transient universe with the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Uh, so it covers a wide range of, um, of topics uh, within the transient universe. Uh, and I am, I've been asked to give a, uh, an invited talk on solar system observations again. Um, 
So if you if you join, uh, maybe you'll see a lot of this stuff all over again. I'll certainly be cutting out the intro material, of, obviously for a, a Roman based conference. Um, but uh, and I look to do some additional work uh, with the ETC, for instance, to uh, um, to actually look at the the different kinds of objects that could be observed in the solar system, things like that. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in hearing more about Roman, uh, more science cases covering all of astronomy, uh, certainly tune in. Um, tune in then. I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, obviously, that's three hours even earlier. Uh, so it might be middle of the night in Europe. Um, if I don't know exactly what they haven't released the schedule yet. So, uh, but keep your eyes posted if you're interested in seeing more. All right, I'll now spend the last few minutes talking about solar system investigations. Targeted or not targeted. Obviously, we can't do targeted observations, uh, but I'll focus in on solar system observations. Um, back in 2018, uh, just a, a shameless plug here. Uh, this is available on archive. Uh, I put together a paper uh, that was submitted to the journal for um, astronomical telescopes, instrumentation or instruments and uh, systems uh, on uh, solar system science with WFIRST. Uh, so earlier on, I mentioned that WFIRST is now Roman, uh, but, but during that time it was known as WFIRST. Um, so some of the things I'm gonna be mentioning here are included in this paper. I've gone a little bit farther uh, thinking about those, those uh, observations since then. Uh, but be sure to check it out if uh, you're interested in seeing more. Uh, so here's the field of regard again. Um, I'm showing this again because it's very important for solar system observations. Um, obviously for objects farther away, right, uh, of astrophysical inter interest, uh, you just have to wait for the field of regard to cover uh, that part of the sky, uh, which will happen you know, twice each year because of the two sections of the field of regard. For solar system observations, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, obviously, we can't look very close in. Um, so we can't observe Earth, the moon, Venus, Mercury, or uh, the sun, or any of the minor bodies within Earth's orbit. Uh, so that would include you know, near-Earth asteroids, uh, long-period comets, Venus trojans, um, things like that. Uh, and then additionally, uh, we can't observe solar system objects when they're brightest at opposition. Um, we can't look directly away from the sun in the same way that we can't look directly at the sun. Uh, so we have to observe them closer to quadrature um, when they're moving slowly. Uh, but the good thing with uh, Roman's uh, field of regard with respect to James Webb Right, so the field of regard is shifted closer to the sun, right, further from opposition, closer to the sun. And that allows for one of the most unique um, uh, science investigations that Roman can carry out, uh, which I'll get to after I show all of the different minor bodies uh, that we can observe uh, with Roman. So here's just a stylized image of the solar system. Uh, and I have plotted here, uh, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Neptune. Uh, and I yeah, definitely want to point out not to scale. Uh, so what can Roman observe? Uh, so you can observe main belt asteroids uh, orbiting between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, there are also the Jupiter Trojans that orbit uh, at the L4 and L5 points of Jupiter. So 60 degrees ahead and behind Jupiter. Uh, there's also this region between the giant planets uh, where the centaur objects orbit. So those are escapees from the Kuiper belt that have not yet become short period comets like, uh, like Halley. Um, so they orbit, they have semi major axes between the giant planets. Uh, there's also the, uh, the Kuiper belt itself. Those will all be fair game because um, they're obviously outside of Earth's orbit. Uh, there are the irregular satellites of the giant planets. Uh, some near-Earth objects, um, depending how near-Earth they are, 
uh, Roman can, can observe those and should be able to track them as well, depending on their apparent rates of motion. Uh, you see some more of these green blobs for uh, Trojan populations of Neptune, Mars, uh, and Earth. And I'll be focusing on the Earth uh, Trojans shortly. Uh, and you also have interstellar objects, right? So with that large field of view, looking uh, off the ecliptic, uh, you know, with the high latitude survey, for instance, um, I'd be surprised if, uh, if additional interstellar objects were not discovered in the high latitude survey, because these things obviously come from any direction in the sky. Um, they're from other solar systems, uh, and there's obviously no preference for them to come in on the ecliptic. Um, and that's also true for long period comets, uh, the ones that come from the Oort cloud, uh, which is a spherical distribution of comets around the sun. Uh, so those can come from any direction as well. Uh, so a very wide range of, of minor body science, um, as well as regular satellite science uh, can be done with Roman. Uh, and as I said, none of these are targeted observations. Most of these would be um, serendipitous or looking for serendipitous uh, uh, targets. All right, now I want to talk about the, perhaps the most unique investigation, solar system investigation with Roman, and that is the search for additional Earth Trojans. Um, so yeah, uh, just a you know, reminder from before, a Trojan is an object that orbits 60 degrees ahead or behind a planet at the L4 or L5 point, uh, and they um, are generally stable uh, in some cases, like for Jupiter and Neptune, there's a very stable population. Those are thought to be primordial. Um, so they're not, they're not temporarily in those orbits. Um, but with uh, only one Earth Trojan known currently, uh, 2010 TK7 discovered 10 years ago now, um, or no, over 10 years ago now, uh, we can't really get an idea of whether or not these are primordial or, or temporary captured objects um, orbiting, you know, sharing Earth's orbit. Uh, we have a, a suspected but not confirmed second object that also is at L4, uh, but again, a population size of two uh, doesn't get the job done. So it's important to detect and study these due to the proximity to Earth. Uh, you know, in addition to understanding their origins, um, <clears throat> they are a definite target for future robotic and manned, manned correctly, you know, I, I said that correctly, uh, manned spaceflight missions, uh, because it's easy to get to them. It doesn't take a whole lot of, of fuel to get there and to get back, because they're in the same orbit, right? Um, so that, you know, very interesting future targets, uh, you, you know, you can imagine, um, sample return missions for sure uh, with that. Uh, the, the challenge of course uh, for detecting these objects is uh, that they, they share Earth's orbit. Uh, and if you wanna see them from the Earth, you have to look into twilight just as the sun is setting to look for tiny little rocks, tiny faint rocks. Um, and that's why we've only seen one and that one was detected using uh, the WISE spacecraft. So that wasn't even on the Earth. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, James Webb cannot look in that direction. Uh, so it cannot be used to, for this investigation. I don't believe Hubble can be used for this either. Might be too close to the sun or maybe you know, might not put the solar panels in the right direction or something, uh, but also has a much smaller field of view. Um, so Roman will be uniquely suited to carrying out this investigation, both at L4 and L5, uh, and it'll be able to observe them all year round. Um, so uh, those objects will always be visible, uh, are observable by Roman, um, and hopefully be able to detect some additional, um, uh, you know, additional targets to, to fill out the population a bit more uh, and help determine their origins. Um, and also for future planning of, of spacecraft missions. Uh, another unique investigation, or not, not necessarily unique, but uh, one where Roman will excel in its efficiency uh, is the um, regular satellites of the giant planets. Uh, 
uh, filling out the populations of those uh, of the of those irregular. Sorry, how can I not say populations twice? Each of the giant planets has its own population of irregular satellites, uh, and there's different levels of or different. Um, we observe targets down to different sizes, obviously based on the distance from the Earth, as well as whether or not there's been a spacecraft mission there, right? So we actually know about the smallest regular satellites around Saturn uh, because of the Cassini mission. Um, but the irregular satellites are thought to be uh, captured from um, primordial or, or current uh, uh, minor body populations in heliocentric orbit. Uh, and then once they are in orbit around the, the planets, which they can be almost any direction uh, and are more likely to be retrograde than prograde because it's easier to capture them, um, they're then collisionally processed as they you know, collide with other irregular satellites. Uh, and this creates families of, uh, of irregular satellites around each object. Um, Two of the, the most famous ones are Phoebe around Saturn, uh, I see the picture in the bottom left, and Triton around Neptune. These provide the best evidence that uh, some of these objects are from the Kuiper Belt. Uh, as you can see in the plot there at the right, their colors match very well with some of these, uh, the KBOs and centaurs. Um, so the, there's definitely linkage there, uh, but there could be obviously objects from other minor body populations as well. Um, and here's a really quick view. So here's the, uh, I plot the hill spheres of each giant planet. Um, and the hill sphere is, is the region where uh, satellite is stable around the planet uh, and not, um, not influenced enough by the sun to enter heliocentric orbit. Uh, and in the center of each of those hill spheres is the Roman WFI field of view. Uh, and even for Jupiter's hill sphere, which is obviously the largest because Jupiter is the largest, uh, but also the closest, uh, it only takes 17 separate pointings to cover the entirety of the hill sphere of Jupiter. Uh, and when you go down to Uranus and Neptune, it's only six pointings. So you can imagine, um, you know, doing a thousand second image at each of those 17 pointings, uh, coming back a day later to look for, for um, change in motion, because uh, some of these objects take years to orbit their giant planets. Um, but it'd be a very efficient search um, very deep, very efficient search for these to fill out these populations. Uh, so I focus, my, my uh, science is focused on trans objects or Kuiper Belt objects, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and Roman will also excel in this region, to, in this uh, arena too, um, in, especially in the search for extreme TNOs uh, or ETNOs, which are the ones that were detected uh, and they have similar enough orbits that pointed to a, uh, um, you know, a, a ninth planet, a very large, or not very large, but a, you know, an Uranus Neptune sized object uh, orbiting at very large distances, uh, hundreds or even thousands of AU. Um, so on the right here, I show a picture from, or a plot from uh, the paper uh, where, uh, shows the limiting magnitude in 10 1,000 second exposures with Roman. You get down to a V magnitude of about 30.2. Um, and this can be used to detect, as you see, a Sedna-like object. So an object that's 2,000 kilometers across, you can detect that out to about 800 AU. Um, on the shorter end, uh, you can find a 50 kilometer object at about 100 AU. And right now we know of two objects currently beyond 100 AU. Um, so this would help definitely uh, you know, look for objects at further distances, but also help find some of these additional ETNOs to test the Plan 9 hypothesis. Uh, and there was a recent call for a pre-selection uh, astrophysics survey uh, that ended a few weeks ago. Uh, and I submitted an idea uh, that I called the Roman Survey for Extreme TNOs, uh, Rosette. Um, obviously, you come up with the acronym first, and then you fill it in afterwards. Um, but this would use that, uh, you know, that, that formula of 10 1,000 second exposures using that widest filter. Uh, you have four fields of view uh, stacked on each other like this, uh, orientation on the sky up for debate. Um, 
we basically get one square degree of sky uh, in each uh, each um, each place that you go to, right? Uh, and you only have five percent overheads based on the the current overhead models. It would be five percent overheads, uh, whereas covering the same field of view with JVST and NearCam uh, would take multiple days rather than three hours. Uh, it would require a hundred different mosaic tiles and the maximum efficiency you could reach would be 50%, right? So you're spending multiple days and half that time is actually for science and half of it is for overheads. Um, so you come back to the same positions on the sky, three different times, look for, for distant uh, changes in motion. Obviously these objects are far away. So you need to uh, come back over larger periods of time. Um, and the idea, of course, would be avoid the galactic plane. So avoid uh, star con uh, contamination from background stars. Uh, and the, the call was for an idea for 700 hours of time. Uh, so in this time, you cover 20 square degrees with this formula uh, and reach deeper than any previous or future um, planned survey. Uh, so uh, the Rubin Observatory's LSST uh, will get down to 24 and a half in SDSSR. Uh, and this, um, uh, this survey idea, we get down to 28.5, uh, additional four magnitudes fainter uh, to look for the most distant objects ever, ever seen. Uh, and I'll hurry up. I'm almost to the end right now. Uh, really quickly, uh, stellar occultations. Um, are a very useful tool for, for identifying very small targets or you know, uh, uh, sizes of objects, um, especially those in the trans-Neptunian region. Uh, this is the, what was used to detect Pluto's atmosphere back in the late 80s uh, and rings around uh, the, the centaur Chiriclo and the dwarf planet Haumea. Um, and <clears throat> there's a possibility for serendipitous occultations with uh, Roman. So each of the 18 WFI detectors uh, will be able to obtain a guide star in each observation. Uh, there will be a little uh, subarray within each detector uh, that'll be read out at a rate of about 5.8 Hertz. Uh, so we read out faster than the rest of the detector. Um, and in, in, you know, in practice, you're not gonna use guide stars in all 18 or you might be, uh, not be able to find guide stars in all 18 detectors. Uh, but these data should be downlinked to earth and then uh, they can be analyzed later to look for um, small objects passing in front of those guide stars uh, and uh, get a serendipitous occultation uh, in order to observe the, the smallest objects uh, that we can't observe with uh, re through in reflected light. And of course, there's gonna be synergies of Roman with um, these other uh, state-of-the-art facilities. Um, you know, Rubin Observatory, LSST, uh, can only cover the southern part of the sky. It'll have a little bit of a north ecliptic spur to cover the ecliptic in the northern part of the sky, uh, but it won't be able to observe anything above that, right? So Roman can help fill in the gaps um, or be used for follow-up uh, on things discovered in the southern sky. Uh, and in particular, Roman as a survey machine uh, should be able to identify new exciting objects that can be targeted with James Webb um, uh, for spectroscopic follow-up, uh, things like that. So I'll leave my summary slide up uh, and uh, thank you again for listening. Uh, I hope that it's able to give you some new information on Roman and get you excited for uh, the next few years uh, in space astronomy. So I'm happy to take any questions now. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. We'll do it. I hope you can hear that. So uh, thank you. Um, questions, please. That's going to be challenging. <laughs> Maybe we'll start here from Crete. Are there any questions here from the audience? People in the room. Yeah, I can see. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. But yeah, the microphone is here. <laughs> so I saw your uh, the data. I just missed it, uh, but you said that you're going to go down to twenty-eight point five magnitude. Is that for a single 
shot because the number you put in for MSSD is for the 30 second exposure. Uh, yes. So, um, yeah, that would be for the 10 1000 seconds. Um, so the, the total of 10,000 seconds, uh, you can get down to 28.5. Uh, so the, let me just, so the idea would be for, um, you know, each of these, uh, each of these pointings, uh, you'd have 10 different dithers, like subpixel dithers to cover, or not necessarily subpixel, but to cover the gaps. Um, so you're filling in the entire area of that, that quarter square degree. Um, in, in 10,000 seconds, and that would get you down to 28.5. So yes, the, the LSST gets down to 24.5 in one 30 second exposure. Um, but if an object is moving fast enough, right, and you have a few day cadence, you're not necessarily observing the, um, the, the target um, in multiple, multiple spots, right, uh, or multiple times. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions from Warsaw? There is one on Zoom. Chris, please. Hi, thanks for the talk. So my question is, what, what do you exactly mean by the absolute latest date as May 2017? Is it just the closing of the window and the next opens when? Um. This is just what I've heard from the, the Roman folks. So as I said, I work on James Webb um, and I'm not officially a part of the Roman mission at Space Telescope. Uh, but from what, I've, what I've heard from them is that uh, the NASA basically wanted to set a, a final date of launch, right? So there are a lot of windows to get out to L2. Um, so the, the idea is to say, we're not going to launch this any later than May, 2027, based on the current plan. Uh, and that's to give uh, a hard deadline, which is something that James Webb did not necessarily have for the past 10 years. Yeah, but does it mean that if you somehow, and it is, you know, with spacecraft, it is possible, if you somehow pass, pass the deadline, then what does it mean? It doesn't mean you disassemble the, the telescope, right? Uh, I certainly hope not. Uh, I don't. I don't see that being the case. Um, yeah, I think they're just they're trying to to push people to meet that deadline. Uh, I can't promise that there won't be any slippage based on what I've seen with James Webb. Uh, but yeah, the the idea is to aim for that um, as about as hard a deadline as they can make at this point in time. Yeah. But no, they're not going to to scrub the mission if they don't make it. You know, it's you know it's June first now. Just. Just throw it away. No, it's not going to be. <laughs> not going to be like that. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yep. There is a question on chat from Josh. Uh, why there is only five plus five years operation? Is it due to fuel being exhausted? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but if it's anything like James Webb, the mission lifetime is. Uh, is determined by how much fuel is available to stay in orbit around L2. Otherwise, it'll start drifting away from L2. I uh, won't be able to communicate with Earth as well. Uh, in the five years, um, I mean, they, they usually break this up into two pieces, right? So that the five years is just for the initial purposes of, of giving money to the mission, right? So say we'll fund five years of it, uh, and then if we have enough fuel, we can extend it five years further, but ask for that money later. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so are there questions from the uh, Copernicus lecture room in Warsaw? We probably need to ask you to come forward and unmute. No, I just I just wanted to comment. In general, these five plus five years is based on different consumables. Uh, I'm guessing the fuel is the main one. Makes most sense to me. Yeah. Right. 
Marius in Warsaw, are there any questions there? Because I can't see very much. No. No, there is no question. There is no question. Can I have a question? Please. Okay. So, Warsaw first. No, no questions. Okay. Come forward. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you. It was, it was great. So, I have a question, maybe not for the, the study on supernovas for the cosmological measurements. Um, is it planned that you know the um, the, the if I remember correctly, you said it's going to be two years of six months of observations. So is the data because I used to well, um, probably most of them won't be supernova one A's, but will be other types of transits. Are those going to be published immediately, or is this going to be just part of the study for the two years, um, and then at the end publish uh, you know the output? Um, so are you, are you asking about availability of the data? Yes, yeah, so, but for this particular um, project, right, for, for one A's, so availability of the data for the supernova photometry and spectroscopy that you mentioned. Ah, um, yes, so my, my understanding is that the data, right, they'll be stored on board for a little bit of time, transmitted to the earth, uh, and then processed through the pipeline. And once they are processed through the pipeline, they'll be made available in mass, uh, the, the archive, uh, immediately. So it's not going to be like a, it's not going to be like, you know, a Gaia data release, for instance, not going to wait for certain milestones or until the end of the program to release everything at once. Um, I believe it'll all be released uh, as it's, as it's being made. Uh, that is my, that is my understanding. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but that's going to be a huge volume of data, right? That's going to be a challenge. Yes, but and that's what some of, the, um, some of those opportunities are for is to help, you know, understand uh, and prepare for that humongous flood of data. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so Radek just commented that there will be like two days delay of downlink. So that's that's probably uh, the delay we can can expect. It's like in Gaia. Anyway, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, that was very um, uh, informative and very um, broad. So um, thank you very much for this overview. And um, thank you all for joining. I thank the Warsaw University uh, people in the room. In on the Zoom, uh, half of the world on the Zoom, and people here in Crete. <laughs> so that we made it, uh, we survived the technicalities here. Uh, so thank you all for joining and goodbye. Thank you.